وبالحق أنزلناه وبالحق نزل وما أرسلناك إلا مبشرا ونذيرا وقرآنا فرقناه لتقرأه على الناس على مكث ونزلناه تنزيلا إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله All praise belongs to Allah We praise him, we seek his forgiveness and his guidance We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of our own egos and the evil results of our deeds Anyone whom Allah guides, then no one can lead him astray and anyone whom Allah leaves to stray, then there is none that can guide him. And I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship and no gods in reality except Allah, who is alone and has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is his slave and his final messenger. The Quran. The Qur'an is the book of revelation used by the Muslims and it's a guidebook to help the Muslim and the non-Muslim and all of mankind make their way through the world. But how do we understand what's going on in the Qur'an? Two famous scholars, Orientalists, one Muslim, one non-Muslim, but a very similar educational background came to two contradictory understandings about the Qur'an. One considered the Qur'an very, he said, not, nothing but a sense of, of loyalty would make a person or any European read the Qur'an or even finish it. The other said, the most beautiful thing I have ever heard in the English language. What was the difference? He said, uncomparable to anything that we've heard in the English language, I should say. The difference is one understood Arabic and the other didn't. Nowadays, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. But many English speaking people do not know what is in the Quran. My job here today is to take you through one juz of the Quran. What am I talking about, one juz? The Qur'an as it is, is 604 pages thick. Besides the first two pages, every 20 pages is a portion or a section of Qur'an. So the Qur'an is broken down into 30 20 page sections. Okay, so each part we call it a juz. My job is to explain the first juz. Let's get to it. The Qur'an starts off with Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah means chapter. Al-Fatiha, it means the opening chapter. So, originally it wasn't called Al-Fatiha, the opening chapter. Originally it was called Surah Al-Hamd, the, the chapter of praising, because it begins by praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, glorified and exalted. And then it is, in essence, the Surah is a dua, a prayer. Teaching us the adab, the manners of asking Allah. And the whole chapter, all it is, it leads up to the prayer and then it explains the rest of the prayer. The actual dua, the actual question or talab, the thing that we're requesting and taught to request is guidance. Ihdina. Allah teaches us that the thing that we need to ask Him for the most is guidance. Ihdina guide us. And the rest of the surah, it just explains how people utilized the guidance or did not utilize the guidance. So it goes to two extremes. On one extreme, there were people who received guidance and they did not use it. They became arrogant and they ignored the guidance and the knowledge that they had. They didn't work with the knowledge that they knew. Okay? And then the other extreme were people who did not actually know what they were talking about. 
So they invented things and attributed it to Allah. They acted without knowledge. The guidance here that the Muslim is asking for is between those two extremes. To get knowledge and to work with what you know, and not to pretend that you don't know. And at the same time, going to the other extreme, <coughs> not to act without knowledge, not to invent things that you have no knowledge for. And that's how the Quran starts. Guide us. Then we go to the next chapter, the chapter called Al-Baqarah, or the Ka'ah. Some people translate it as the heifer, but this is incorrect, as usually a heifer is younger. You know, the cow is, is more, uh, a better theme for it. It gets its name from a story. There's two stories of a cow inside Surah Al-Baqarah. One is about a cow, or the ajl, the calf, that the people took to worship the Jews, the people of Israel, when Musa, when Moses went up on the mount, you know, and was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. They took a calf and they worshipped it, made it into gold. But it's not called Baqarah for that story. It's called Baqarah or the cow for another story that comes in the Quran, still dealing with the people of Moses, Bani Israel. When there, I don't want to ruin the story for you, but in order to, to understand how this chapter got its name, Something happened. The man was killed, and the people of Israel didn't know who did it. So they went to their prophet Moses, and they asked him, how do we find out the answer here? And he prayed to Allah, and Allah told him they should slaughter a cow. They were so petty and so trifling with regards to this cow that finally Allah made it revealed to them that they had to buy the most expensive cow in the whole town in order to fulfill the, the, the obligation that they wanted to, to get at, the, the, the thing they wanted to arrive at. This story held so much significance to the Prophet Wasallam and his companions that the whole chapter, the whole entire chapter, which happens to be the longest chapter in the whole Quran, is now forever known as Surah Al-Baqarah, the story of the cow. I encourage people to read that story and to try to understand the significance of the story. The significance of the story is they came requesting something from, from their prophet and they did not respect the response. And this has been and is the challenge man has constantly. We're asking Allah to guide us. They asked their prophet for guidance. Then he gave them the guidance. Allah gives us the guidance, but we don't accept it. We say, what, are you playing with us? Do you mean all we have to do is, no, we don't accept that. And we're going, and this has been the fundamental challenge. And we'll see that theme oft repeated again and again in the Quran. So Surah Al-Baqarah gets its name from that story. Now, what is this story about? This, this juz, or this portion of the Quran, it starts off with saying, الكتاب, لا ريب فيه. Lots of people don't understand what's going on here because it begins with Alif, Lam, Mim. No one knows what these words mean, but we do know what it does. These words, though we don't know their exact meaning, what they do, they draw your attention. They, they, they drag you into listening to what's going to happen next. This is the book, no doubt whatsoever, it's from Allah. That's how it starts. A guidance, a guidebook for those who have consciousness. So now three types of people have been described now. Three types, and this is very important because Allah is teaching us with this guidebook about us. There are only three types of people. After telling us this is a guidebook for everybody who has consciousness, and then it describes those who have consciousness are those who believe in Allah. They believe in the one God. They believe in the last day. They believe that there's going to come a time where we're going to be resurrected and questioned about what happens here in this earth. And they believe in the unseen matters, life after death, the torments in the grave. These people have been described as also believing in the books that came before, the things that we find in the Bible. Lots of people believe that Muslims don't believe in the Bible or in Jesus and these different prophets, where the first thing we see here, see in the Mus'haf, in the Quran, is that they believe in what was revealed before the Quran, the books of revelation that came before. 
The first thing we're taught. And it tells us that these are the people that will be successful. That's fundamentally placed. Then it describes the people who don't believe. Well, men are nice. There's going to be some people that do not believe. Whether you warn them or you don't warn them, they're never going to believe. Allah has made these people and created these people to be disbelievers. And no matter what you say to them, they will never believe. And then a third type of person is described. And the longer description is given to him. These are the hypocrites. The worst. We're not talking about the social hypocrite. The social hypocrite is what we find in ourselves where we say something we don't necessarily mean. And that's for light. But the religious hypocrite is the one that says outwardly what inwardly he does not believe. He outwardly proclaims belief, but inwardly he does not believe. This person is going to be in the lowest part of the flame. And so the Quran goes on. And as it goes on, we learn the first order that we're given. After being describing the three types of people, Allah tells us next in the Quran, Ya khalaqakum. Allah says, O oh people, O oh mankind, it's telling everybody, O oh mankind, worship your Lord. This is the fundamental order, first order in the Quran. O oh people, O oh mankind, worship your, your Lord. And then it tells us that I am the one, Allah is the one that's created you and everybody before you, so that perhaps you would gain consciousness of your Lord. So that you remember your Lord. And then it gives us reasons why we should worship Allah. The one who sends down rain, the one who, who makes us, gives us life, the one that's going to cause us to die. And if, and his challenge is, is put, put here. And if you don't believe that this is from Allah, immediately, then bring something like it. Then you create something similar. So the Quran is going piece by piece to call us to the call to Islam. If you disbelieve, after ordering you to worship your Lord, and if you don't think that this is from your Lord, then you, O oh human, come and just bring one ayah, one ayah, one line, something similar to it. But if you can't do it, and you'll never be able to do it, then watch out for the one that can throw you in a fire whose fuel is men and stones. It's been prepared for those people who disbelieve, who dare to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, I don't believe that you're God. The Quran goes on and Allah tells us immediately he's not shy to give us an example of even the smallest thing, the small, even a gnat. And after that, is given as an example, we're told about our creation immediately. This is following a trend that is strengthening the believer. Because now after beginning and telling you this is from Allah, no doubt, there are three types of people. Worship your Lord. If you don't believe it, then bring something like it. Matter of fact, let me tell you how you were created. Everybody wants to know how they were born. When your parents tell you this is what happened on that day, you're interested. Now Allah is telling us, this is how you are created. With qala rabbuka, what your Lord said, lil malaika to the angels, inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I am making in the world a deputy. I'm going to put someone that's going to be in charge of everything. And man is in charge. We don't control the winds where we can do whatever we, what, what, what we tell the wind to go left and right. But we fly through the air and the wind doesn't stop us. We don't tell the mountain to get up and move, but we cut holes and use the mountain and boil its rocks and turn it into metal. We do what we want. We're not as strong as a cow or a bull, but we eat those things and we make them subservient to us. So being the caliph or the deputy means that we are in charge here on this planet. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let the angels know that, the angels in all the creation said, why are you going to do that when this thing that you're going to make is going to cause Corruption is going to spill blood. And they knew the nature of man. And we know this was only because Allah had taught them these things. At that point, Allah teaches us an important lesson. He says, I know what you don't know. So we don't know the, the, the wisdom of Allah by making us the deputy here in the earth, but we know he did. And so after creating man, we see that Allah made all the creation bow down to man. Everyone did except for Iblis. Iblis is Satan or shaitan as we say in the Arabic language. And shaitan 
or Iblis, he puts forth the reasons why he refuses. He refuses, he says, you know, I'm better than this man. This thing, this thing that you created, he doesn't even realize the great nature that you've given him. And you put him in charge of everything? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes the shaitan. He says, okay, you get out of the paradise and you're going to go to hell. And then the shaitan, he immediately says, well, give me a break. And as getting this break, he now says, I'm going to attack this man and I'm going to come to him in many different ways in order to prove to you that he's not worth it, that you made a mistake. And so Allah teaches us, hey, watch out for shaitan. He's out to get you. And this is immediately important for us in the beginning of the book because now we know that our challenge for the rest of our existence is going to be a battle between us and shaitan. He is out to get us. Why? Because he is jealous. Because he is upset. Man then gets tricked out of Jannah, out of the paradise, because he didn't realize the nature or how vigilant shaitan is going to be at trying to make him slip. And so Allah forgives Adam for falling victim to his desires, but he doesn't forgive shaitan for falling victim to his arrogance. So we learn the difference of punishment between desire and arrogance. As the Quran goes on, we see story after story. One of the main things we're taught, and again, the beginning of this surah, is that don't order people to do something and then forget to do it yourself. Don't take a portion of the revelation and practice it and then pretend like the other portion doesn't exist. That is going back to explaining, don't be like those people in the beginning when we ask for guidance who know when they don't act on their knowledge. So the whole Surah Al-Baqarah, which is basically the Quran in brief, is telling us and warning us and preparing us not to accept guidance partially but to accept it wholeheartedly and to enter Islam into Islam wholeheartedly. And then stories of the children of Israel go time and time again. And then Suleiman, the prophet Solomon, is entered into the equation and we're taught that voodoo, magic, and all types of santaria, whatever you want to call it, you know, black magic, the occult, all these things are illegal. All these things, whether you, 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 you think they have benefit or not, all these things are going to drive a person to hellfire and that a person in actuality is oppressing himself. And don't blame this on Suleiman. Don't say that Suleiman started this. No, Suleiman is free of doing this type of thing, but rather this was a test from Allah to see if those people would be firm and stick to their knowledge or they would not be firm and fall victim to their desires. Again, Allah gives us examples after examples of the children of Israel and how they went about uh, asking their prophets over and over again, the prophet Moses, and then not following the guidance. And so Allah asks us, Do you guys want to be like those other people? You're going to keep asking your prophet, and then you're going to be just like they did with Moses, and then not follow the guidance? Or just keep asking question after question, not really wanting the response, but just wanting to be petty and minuscule. And these are the things that the Prophet ﷺ taught us will lead the people to the hellfire. So the Qur'an goes on giving us more and more example of that. Then when we get towards the end of the whole juz, the last part of the juz, we're entered into Ibrahim, the Prophet Ibrahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us, وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودَ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِيَ مِلَّتَهُمْ He gives us a warning. He says, when the Qur'an has come and you start to practice this religion, this aspect of what came before, the Jews and the Christians are going to become upset. They're going to become uncomfortable with that. Why? Because people live in fear. What is fear? Fear is false evidence accepted as reality. F-E-A-R. False evidence accepted as reality. The scriptures of old, as any scholar of Christendom or Judaism will tell you, have been mixed. We've lost them for a period of time. And some people have written, some scribes have written into their opinions into the word of God. People have accepted some of this false evidence as real as reality. So the Qur'an, the reason for the whole Qur'an is to clarify the truth of those revelations and to clarify likewise the falsehood and to bring the furtherance of the message of the very first prophet 
Adam, all the way from Noah, Noah, from Isa, Jesus, Moses, Musa, Elijah, Jesus himself, and Muhammad to fruition, to the end part, ending with the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But because people have become comfortable with their fears and their little blanket, security blanket, they will never be pleased with what they hear because it means we have to make change and people are afraid of change. So Allah warns us here that this will be a challenge for those who believe. Then he goes down and says, Ibrahim. Ibrahim or Abraham is the father of Islam. Just like he's the father of Judaism and Christianity, all the religion, the major religions called to Ibrahim and Ibrahim called to all of them. But his message was one and that was worship one God. And he wasn't amongst the people who committed shirk or associated partners with Allah. This is again a fundamental theme that goes all throughout every one of the religions and especially is focused on in Islam. And it explains in the last part that this is the religion of Ibrahim. That Ibrahim is the one who named us Muslims. That Ibrahim is the one that built the Kaaba. And Ibrahim is the one that's calling us to Islam. And he's made a dua for the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to come and for the, to come someone to guide the people towards Islam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, Allah says, they will say, be a Jew or a Christian and you will be guided. And he say, rather say to them, Bal millata Ibrahim Hanifa. Rather we say, we are going to follow the religion of Abraham. We are going to follow the religion of Abraham. And he was not one that associated partners with Allah. And we say that we believe in Allah. And this is what the Quran is telling us here. We believe in Allah. And what has been revealed to Abraham and Ismail and, and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes of Israel and what Musa, Moses was given and what Isa, Jesus was given. We don't make any distinction between any of the prophets and we submit to Allah in Islam. This is the last message that we have in the last part of this first part of the Quran is a call to let us know the beginner in the beginning part of the Quran that we believe in all the books that came before and the prophets that came before and we are not going to make association of partners with Allah. This is what I have to offer for you guys today. Allah has revealed the best of speech. A book that is repetitively consistent with itself. Those that fear their Lord get goosebumps from it. And when their skin relaxes, their hearts are filled with the remembrance of Allah. This is the guidance of Allah that He uses to guide whosoever He wants. And whomsoever Allah leaves to stray, then there is no one that can guide Him. My name is Abu Tawba, and I've been your guide through this portion of the Quran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. وَأَنْ أَتْلُوَ الْقُرْآنَ فَمَنْ اِهْتَدَى فَإِنَّمَا يَهْتَدِي لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ ضَلَّ فَقُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُنْ